Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. This is episode 41. This evening is the 6th of August, 2012. We chat to Alex McLeod about what's possible when you teach teenagers entrepreneurship. Good evening. Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. What's possible when we explore ideas, challenge thinking, and inspire action? I'm your host this evening. My name is Mongezi Imtati. I'm here with Jonathan Dix. Hey, how's it going, Mongezi? Good, good. Yourself? Cool, man. Yeah. Looking forward to tonight. With us this evening is Alexander McLeod, who is the new guy in charge <laughs> at ID8. He's passionate about fostering entrepreneurship, as you'll soon find out, in South Africa. He has developed and is currently implementing his third independent school entrepreneurship program. To date, he has over 100 learners from seven different high schools. Alex, how's it? Yeah, good and you, Mongezi? <laughs> very well, thanks. Very well. Um, so just to kick off, um, I mean, you were in corporate for eight years before you started your journey toward an entrepreneurship. Why would you, I mean, why would you leave a posh job for, you know, for salty cracks every single day of the month? Salty cracks. <laughs> you know, Mugesi, um, when you, when, when things come to you easily and yes. life is just passing you by and every month someone pays you a nice salary and all that sort of thing, life becomes very boring. Mm. Um, there's no challenge. And I... I the person that I am, I always enjoy a challenge. And, um, yeah, like I said, it just became very mundane, getting up, doing the same thing, hanging around the same people every day with the same mindset, the same nonsense being spoken, the same stories, the same blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, very bored. I, I felt I had a lot more to offer. Okay. Um, and, yeah, that's really why I so, backed up and left. So, so, a bit earlier, I mean... Um, as part of your profile, I mentioned that you started the Independent School Entrepreneurship Program. Tell us a bit about that. What is it? All right, cool. Um, so basically, maybe just a little bit of background around the School Entrepreneurship Program. Um, as you mentioned, I've been involved in corporate for about eight years. Yes. Um, but prior to, prior to being employed in, the, in, in, in professional services, I did a postgraduate in entrepreneurship mm. at UCT. Um, and ever since 2003, when I finished the, uh, the postgraduate, I'd been engaging and I'd been exposing myself to, to, to entrepreneurship and, and entrepreneurs, you know, keeping in touch, chatting, discussing, you know, workshops and all that sort of thing. Yes. And I'd always been very interested in, very interested in, in the way an entrepreneur thinks. Mm. Uh, a lot of people think that entrepreneurs are these brilliant, highly intelligent individuals and with all due respect And we are. Entrepreneurs. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I like my salary. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's a, there's a fundamental difference between an entrepreneur and a very successful professional services corporate individual. And that's that an entrepreneur is able, he's very aware of his surroundings. Yes. He's very aware of what's going on around him and he's able to identify um, elements in his surrounding environments that he can capitalize on. Now, yes. not everybody can do that. True. Um, and that's, that's where this whole awareness around thinking like an entrepreneur uh, came, around, ca came about. And that's what really interested me. And I thought, you know what, if, if, if I had learned, if I had been exposed to this sort of thing when I was at high school, mm. um, I probably would not have gone to study at UCT. I would have probably not have worked in the corporate world for eight years. I would have probably left high school and gone to try and start up my own business straight away. Yes. So I figured, well... Nobody's doing this. Why don't I just do it? But and isn't that? But but I mean, is it, I mean, there's a there's a there's a lot of debate around why people aren't teaching teenagers or school kids, as it were, right? Because on the one hand, you, people would rather work for a couple of years and then start a business, or just start a bit, or just start a business straight out of school, straight out of high school or varsity or whatever the case is. I mean, isn't there a bit of merit to working for a couple of years and then starting a business? Yeah, I suppose there is if you are not entirely entrepreneurial in, in nature. Um, mm. 
entrepreneurs don't think let's go and ride comfortably first and then kick off later. Yes. They dive into things straight away. Um, that's what I say again, is that they're able to spot opportunities and capitalize on them straight away. Yeah. Um, I, I can't think of one entrepreneur that said, hey, that's a good idea. Let's try and tackle that in a year's time. No, it doesn't work like that. Um, they, they, they spot ideas and they jump on it straight away. Um, how they get it done and how they actually approach and how they try and take advantage, they figure out as they go along, as yeah. they go along. And again, that, that, that's what I'm trying to do with my school entrepreneurship program. I, I'm not trying to tell kids, don't go and study, don't go and get a job. Yes. What I'm doing is that I'm just allowing <clears throat> them or affording them an opportunity to be exposed to this lifestyle, mm. um, to this new mindset. And giving them another aspect to think about. Alex, um, sorry, I was going to yeah. say, do you think that it, this is something that can be taught, though? I mean, I, I, I like the idea of exposing uh, youngsters, uh, even up to the sort of age of 24, 25. A lot of people don't know what they want to be doing. But is it something that you can be taught, or is it something that's just inherently inside you? Um, John, that's, that's a very good question, and, and I, I firmly believe that you can. Um, there's one reason that you go to high school. Or there's one reason that you go to school. And that's to learn how to think. Now, if you can incorporate an element of entrepreneurial thinking, all you're doing is you're just improving uh, the offering at school. Now, if you go, if you go to high school and you're interested in maths mm -hmm. and science, your thinking is developed in that way. If you go to school and you gear towards arts, drama, culture. The way you think, your attitude to life is geared towards that. I'm saying, why not give another avenue? Why You, you can do it. Kids are, are creative by nature. Yeah. That's why they sit and daydream all day in class. That's why they sit and draw pictures. That's why they sit and tr come up with the weirdest of ways to try and bunk class. That's why they, you know, <laughs> they just, they're creative. Naturally, they're creative. They're always thinking. They're always scheming, as my dad always likes to say. He always is, you know, you guys are always scheming, you know? Now, I'm saying, why are we trying to suppress that? Okay. Let's, let's give it an opportunity. Let's see where it takes us. But now that's me speaking. That's an entrepreneur speaking. That's somebody who's willing to take a risk mm. to say, let's see what happens if we give these kids the opportunity. I firmly believe, for example, right, and this is probably a bit contentious, but um, I'll say it. I firmly believe that, I, that, that, that kids could have solved the textbook problem. They would have made a way to get textbooks to their school. Yeah. If you really wanted to learn, if you really wanted a textbook, you would have hustled to get money to get a textbook. Am I not right? Look, that is a very contentious issue. I'm not actually too sure on that one myself personally. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that one sitting on the fence. But um, <laughs> but, no, but what I, 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 what I'm trying I, to get is, is, is that kids are inherently able to be creative. They're sneaky they're Russians when they need to be. And, and that creativity is suppressed as we go along. I'm saying let's explore it. Let's give kids the opportunity to come up with the most amazing ideas, the most amazing uh, initiatives. That, that will improve their lives, their schools, their communities, whatever it is. But now mm. what happens is people look at, 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 at kids and say, no, but you're only a kid. You can't get it done. I'm saying no. I'm saying that give them a chance. And that's what my program is trying to do. And it's not at just uh, the privileged schools, your private schools or your sort of upper class model C schools. This is really right down at the grassroots with uh, kids who are perhaps not able to afford, you know, even clothes or the likes of that. It's really giving them the opportunity to really expand their their horizons. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, with regard to that, um, I've got something called the School Entrepreneurship Trust, which I've established. Um, obviously, I, I had to I had to launch my program at schools uh, where the learners could afford to to pay to come on my program. Mm. Um, obviously, starting your own business, the most important thing is sales, because without sales, you don't have a business. So I, 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 I approached the more affluent schools uh, where I launched the program, and the program still continues to run there. But I've, now I've just, I've just established something called the School Entrepreneurship Trust where I want to take my program um, to schools, and I, and I wish somebody could give me a better term for this, but I'd mm -hmm. like to take my, my, my program to schools in disadvantaged communities um, because I believe that there are learners out there 
that are able to come up with initiatives that will improve their school learning environment. Um, an improved school learning environment allows for more effective learning, and more effective learning just uh, allows for more competent learners to leave the schooling system. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not talking a mind-blowing, world-changing things. It's just really simple things that will make your learning experience at school more effective. Yeah. Um, I believe that learners have the ability to do that. Um, I, I firmly believe that. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So, so I, mean, you st I mean, you started a lot of programs, rather, that start with high schools or schools as their target audience get a lot of, you know, they get a lot of, they get a lot of, they meet quite a number of um, resistance, res like, yeah, they meet a lot of resistance rather. Mm -hmm. So how did you move from, you know, one learner to the, to, uh, to the hundredth learner that you have in your program? That's a very interesting question. Um, I experienced something which I, I term the gatekeeper syndrome. Um, I'd, 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 I'd make contact with schools um, at least 50, 60 schools I'd made contact with already yes. um, of which only 6 have responded and allowed me to come and speak to, this, to the entire school offering the program um, and how did I get around that? Well, I used the learners on my program so what I did was the learners that were on my program I asked them, where have you got friends? go to them at those schools and tell them about this program that you're on. Tell them that you're enjoying it. Tell them that you're making money and ask them if they would like to be part of something like this. Mm. And then they would go back, they would go to their mates, they'd go chat to their mates and if their mates came back and said, yeah, they'd love to be on a program like this, then I'd say, okay, give me that learner's contact details. I'd then make contact with the learner and then I'd get the learner to nag the teacher to get me to come <laughs> and speak at the school. Okay, that's <laughs> one way to go about it. Look at you, you the that's kids in kinder news not lost at all, eh? <laughs> <laughs> not at all, mate. I don't know. No, you see, the thing is, and, and, and as more schools come on board, so more schools become receptive. Um, I'm now having less and less of a problem um, making contact with schools, or should I say making contact and having a conversation with the right person. Because mm -hmm. um, it's not a matter of just phoning the school and speaking to the headmaster. Um, it's a matter of finding out who's sort of head of business studies or who's head of EMS or who's head of economics or whatever it is, that person who is supposed to be sort of the forerunner or front runner for entrepreneurship at that school, that's the person that I'd need to speak to. I then obviously need to sell it to that person first um, before they'd allow me to go and speak either in front of the entire school during an assembly or go and speak to, to individual classes. And that's what I did on a couple of occasions. I would actually go and speak to 20, 25 individual classes in, in the space of two or three days. Mm. I remember going to speak at Weinberg Girls High School. Um, for three days straight from 8.30 to 3 o'clock the afternoon. Sure. Whoa. Uh, at, least, yeah, at least six or seven classes saying the same thing over and over again, uh, only to have seven girls register. But that's, that's the nature of the beast. I will do that any day. I'll do it any time if it means that I can get more learners to come on my program and have the opportunity to, to, to engage in a program like this. And, and it's not just me that's on the program. I, yes. I don't only lecture. So the learners don't only come and sort of hang around and chat and chat with me, and I don't only lecture them. I, I, I've got a host of guest speakers and guest lecturers that come on board. Um, so I've got two guest lecturers as well. Um, one of them's Charles Maisel. Yes. He is a, he's an international award-winning social entrepreneur. He started up Shantuka Black Umbrellas. He started up Men uh, on the Side of the Road. Oh, that Australia. guy. Okay, it rings a bell. That that's, guy. that's good. <laughs> that's good. Uh, Tom, tell me something. With your experience, I mean, we were chatting earlier about your, your background and business and that. How have you found uh, the mindset of a teenager versus the mindset of an adult when approaching entrepreneurship? John, that's, that's, that's a really good question. The thing is, these, 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 the, the teenagers are absolutely blown away. They, when you talk entrepreneurship, the first thing that comes to their mind is Steve Jobs, Richard Branson, Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. So yes. they, if, all the celebrity yeah, entrepreneurs. That's it. They, they like, oh, you know, entrepreneur. Boom. I love it. I want to learn about it. I want to engage in the program. And that's cool for me because that, that already means that they're coming into the program hyped up and ready to learn and to find out what's going on. And that's, that's really also one of the reasons why I've made sure that I'm not the only guest speaker. Um, so, or, or, or lecturer on the program. So I, as I mentioned, I got, I've got two guest lecturers, Charles Maisel and um, Natalia Pereira, who mm -hmm. used to be a partner at Bowman Guildford. She lectures on IP, 
intellectual property law. So those are the two guest lecturers. And then I have a host of guest speakers. All of them established successful businessmen. Uh, one of them is Paul Simon, the guy who started up uh, YDE, Young Designers Emporium. Yes. Okay. Uh, he, uh, yeah, he comes and speaks on my program. Um, I've got another guy, Patrick Schofield. He started up Streetwise Artist Collective. He started up Kolakpa, Organic Restaurants, uh, Indalo Projects. Uh, also, Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Award, International Entrepreneur of the Award, award-winning entrepreneurs. Um, I've got Jonathan Jacobs, who's the chairman of the Tourism uh, International Trade and Tourism Committee at the Cape Chamber of Commerce. Um, I've got Dave Liddell, mm-hmm. entrepreneur of notes, owner of his latest company that he's now just started. It's called SolarX Energy, uh, so renewable, renewable energy. My guest speakers are all successful businessmen um, that have been in the game for years. They know what they're talking about. But more importantly, though, is that they each come from a different industry. Um, so the learners are, are exposed to, to what's going on in different industries. And they mm. get to engage with entrepreneurs that have made a success in those industries. So that's important as well, is that it's not just about being an entrepreneur. It's about being an entrepreneur and operating in a specific industry. Yeah. So that's why I've got the five or six guest speakers. They come from different industries. Um, the latest acquisition, if you want to call it that, to my guest speaker list, is a gentleman by the name of Roderick Lambanda, who's the co-chair of the CIO Forum, and he heads up the Portfolio Committee for Information and Communication Technology at the Cape Chamber of Commerce. So he comes and speaks to the kids about ICT and the ICT industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's also a very successful businessman. He speaks at TEDx conferences um, and all that sort of thing. So my, my program, like I said, is it's it's been developed and designed in such a way that the learners, they get a good idea of, 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 of what it takes to be an entrepreneur. You mentioned Not earlier... Just, you mentioned earlier that um, kids are inherently creative and they come up with innovative ways to sort of you know solve problems if you will what are some of the interesting business models that teenagers have come up with okay probably the most interesting one that 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 came out of my program um and funnily enough the kids that have come up that have started businesses are grade eight and grade nine learners, the most successful ones. Yes. Uh, strange enough, they're the youngest. They're the youngest on my program. So my program's got grade eight to grade twelve uh, learners that have registered. But the most interesting one was um, is a youngster. His name is Todd Sundstrom. Mm. He's in uh, grade eight at Sachs this year, and he started up a business called Unpugged, where he was manufacturing doggy dumbbells. You know what a doggy dumbbell is. Hell no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds funny though. I only know dumbbells as those things I ignore in the bathroom. Yeah, or in the <laughs> gym. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. I had no idea what these things were either until he came to me and he showed me his business. Yeah. His business idea. A doggy dumbbell is what it is. It's a it's a it's a wooden dumbbell. Yes. So like a gym dumbbell, but it's made of wood. And it's got a rope on the handle. And it's used by dog trainers for obedience training. So you take this wooden dumbbell and you throw it and the dog has to pick the, the dumbbell up on the handle. If yeah. the dog picks it up on the side or whatever, the dog, uh, I don't know if it gets hit or whatever it is, but the dog doesn't get, treat, get a treat. Okay. We're going to have to put on our show here, no animals were harmed <laughs> <laughs> during the making of this video. <laughs> no. So what happens is that the, the dog then needs to pick the dumbbell up on the handle um, as part of its obedience training. So this is a 14-year-old kid that comes to me and says, Sir, 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 I've got this idea that I just found out. I'm undercutting supplies by 40%. I'm like, what? He's like, hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. All of the private dog trainers that yes. he's been... T- and there's about six or seven of them that are in the greater Western Cape area hmm. have been importing these doggy dumbbells. And he's been able to make and them. And he found this out for... Sp- I don't know how, but I think he's got a dog, obviously. But he found out that, that these people were paying exorbitant prices by importing these doggy dumbbells. So he goes and takes a loan from his dad and buys a lathe, which is a machine that you use to carve and shape wood. Okay. And hmm. he starts manufacturing these in his garage. On weekends, the oak decides he's not playing sport anymore. He does cross country on a Thursday. So he's not involved in team sport on a Saturday. Um, and he uses his time to manufacture doggy dumbbells. And he's made about 4,500, 5,000 rand profit. Sure. Oh, wow. bu- and that profit is off the costs. His product is being stocked at one of the Perky Pets chain stores just down the road for me. I live. And he's 14. All the private dog. 
all the private dog trainers that he's been in contact with, and I think there's five or six of them now buy the product from him, and he's managed to come to an agreement with him that no pe no person can bring their dog to dog training unless they have a doggy dumbbell. So that's the, the agreement that he's managed to reach with them. That's well, clever, sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is a kid that's in grade eight that it's not an amazing, I mean, it's not an amazing business idea. Yes. But this is a kid that somehow managed to undercut supplies by 40%. He spotted a gap. Um, for, for doggy dumbbells. Now, that's for me what is one of the most interesting business ideas that I've ever come across. I, I knew nothing about doggy dumbbells. I knew what a dog trainer was. I used to, I've seen dog shows. Yes. But I've never heard of a dog dumbbell before. And anyway, this kid's stuff is like Perky Pets. It's at the private pet shop just in one of the malls down the road from me here. And he's doing really well. I wanted to ask, Alex, um, for every successful entrepreneur, there are many who do not make it. How do you cover this particular topic amongst the teenagers? Okay, well, at the outset of my program, uh, John, it, my program is modular in nature. So there's five modules that I take the learners through over a period of about, of about five or six months. Okay. And in the first module, uh, module number one is an introduction to entrepreneurship. Um, and during that module is where we really cover everything that's got to do with entrepreneurship. So the mindsets, the behaviors, the success stories, the fact that two out of 10 businesses in South Africa fail within the first two years, they, they're well aware of that. Okay. The thing is, though, is that if the business does not kick off within the first five months, but there is uh, progress, I do keep in touch with them after the program just to monitor what's happening. So there's a nice level a of mentorship of afterwards as well. Yeah, there is. There That's is. Very there good. is. Some of the learners, however, just come on the program for to to sit in the to sit in the sessions, to listen to the guest speakers, to listen to the guest lecturers, and to learn some of the theory. They not they don't all really want to to start up businesses, but those 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 learners that give it a go and don't succeed within the five months, um, I, I I I do keep an eye on them after the program uh, until the end of the year, just to make sure that they are still trying and that they haven't given up. Okay. On, the, on, on their business, especially if it's if it's an idea that I think can work if they just sort of, you know, sort of apply themselves a bit more. Okay. So, so in in terms of just the program itself, um, is this is this something that encourages learners to start their own businesses or to become more employable at the end of their you know at the end of their school year? I think it's I think it's both I mean both both of those uh, two things that you mentioned they are, are, are spin-offs of the program. I mean if they come on an entrepreneurship program, what I'm doing is I'm teaching them all about business. Yes. So they understand the different types of business, they understand SARS, the taxes, registering your business at the CIPC, they understand how to put together a business plan. Um, they the banks come and speak to the learners so they understand the different business banking options or offerings. So they've got a very good grounding in terms of business knowledge so if, the, if i'm not saying that if they had to leave high school they could become the md of a of a company within 10 years but they'd know exactly what's 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 going on in terms of the basics um so from that angle yeah in terms of employability yes uh, i think it will definitely help um i think more so now that my program uh, has been endorsed by the cape chamber of commerce mm -hmm. yeah. and the cio forum, uh i think it, it, it will definitely stand them in good stead if they were to come on the program now. Um, but also just from a start your own business side of things, definitely. Um, they, 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 it, it's definitely an opportunity to do it. I'm not the only person that helps you with your business. If your business is falls in line with any one of the industries that the guest speaker comes on, yes. uh, chat comes to speak about, um, there's a bit of mentorship there, a bit of help there, a bit of assistance available there. So, like I said, it, it, it's just that exposure and that engagement that I'm trying to create. Mm. Um, if you look at all, if you look at, if you look at all the entrepreneurs, man, I mean, none of them. Richard Branson dropped out of school at the age of 16. He was dyslexic. Steve Jobs didn't even finish varsity. He finished six months of his first year. Yeah. Um, Larry Ellison. And he learned about I, fonts, I mean, <laughs> largely. And he learned about that? typography in that six months. Yeah. No. Definitely. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. It's it's how it's it's how much you want to get out of the program. You can just come mm. and sit and listen and not ask any questions, then come to the lecture and sit and listen and get a bit of theory and, and go home with your file and your book. Um, or you can come and actually engage and 
and try and get as much out of it as you can. Mm. Um, I try and make it as as uh, as interesting and and, and as uh, engaging as possible. Yes. But like I said, like I tell the learners at the outset, um, you're only going to get as much out of this program as you actually put into it. I've made a lot available for you. Just today, actually, um, we had a session at BOE. BOE contacted me. They said they'd heard about my program. Would my learners be interested in coming to a session uh, where they'd be sort of uh, a bit of a lecture on, on, on stockbroking? So I said, yes. yeah, no, fantastic. So I had about 14 learners today sitting in the boardroom at BOE in the waterfront. Um, two guys spoke to them on stockbroking, share trading, all that sort of thing. And then they actually took them down into the deal room. Yeah. Um, where, you know, you got all these folks sitting in front of 10 computer screens with the graphs and the numbers and all that stuff. So, again... There's just something else that, that they've got an opportunity. You'd never, I mean, you, not, neither you, not, nobody here would be able to just rock up at BOE and say, hey, listen, I want to find out, can I go into your deal room kind of thing to see what the Oaks are doing? They'll say no. But here's this opportunity on my program for you to, to go to BOE, learn about stockbroking even, even if you're not interested in it, but it, just another thing for you to learn about. And I, I, I think that if there's more opportunity to learn about different things, you find, you'll find yourself quicker. Um, yeah. Um, how, how long is the course? It's five modules. Uh, okay. It runs over a period of about five or six months. Um, if I start a program at the beginning of the year, because of the five million public holidays we have in April and May, um, it runs for about six months. And then if I start a program in June or July, it runs for five months. Okay. And how, so the kids, I'm assuming the kids fund it themselves. Yeah, the learners pay. Uh, what I've done is I, I put an incentive in place. So for the learner that makes, makes the most money, um, there, there's actually two categories. Uh, yes. There's 2,000 Rand up for grabs on my program, um, which is split 1,000, 1,000. So the one award goes to the most innovative idea. Yes. Um, and the other the other 1,000 Rand goes to the learner who's made the most cash. So um, there's those incentives as well on my program. So if you actually work really hard you and you win one of those awards, uh, you could potentially pay off nearly three quarters of, of, of the program fee. Mm. Um, on top of that, the money that you make while you're on the program. So a lot of learners come on board the program, their parents pay, but then I tell them, listen, you're going to pay your parents back afterwards. Um, I think I've got one last question. Yeah, Merck, go for it. Um, I think the last question from me would be, so what is possible for entrepreneurially minded, like teenagers? Mm. What is possible for entrepreneurially minded teenagers? Uh... There's lots possible. Um, you, you know, the thing is, is that you just gotta, you, you've gotta, you gotta be proactive about things. If you yes. wanna start a business, don't sit in your house or sit at your desk and think about starting your business. Go into it. Um, there's lots of people that are willing to assist. There's lots of various programs that you can 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 go on. It's a matter of actually going out there and doing it. Um, I've come across a lot of people since I've been running this program that have come in and said, "Hey, you know what? I've got this business idea that I want to start up." And then I see them six months later and they're like, you know, that business idea, man, I'm still trying to get it off the ground. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, Amazon is exactly what my business idea could have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard loads of those, eh? Um, no, but the thing is, you know, it, it's, I think it's important if you're young, um, because there's, there's such a long, large focus on entrepreneurship right now and it's, it's, it's the buzzword at the moment, people are willing to help you. But you need to get off your bum and you need to be proactive and show your willingness to put a bit of effort in. Um, nobody's going to help you if you don't help yourself, obviously. Um, so to, to any of the young listeners out there, if you have any young listeners, if you're, if you're a teenager, even if you're not a teenager, if you're younger than, than 13 or whatever it may be, but you've got something you want to do, do it. Um, I came across a, a, a girl aged 11 years old the other day. The, the, one of the guys that, that's involved with IDA, he interviewed a, an 11-year-old girl that was selling... Hannah Montana fish tanks. Whoa. Uh, at a mall. <laughs> how, did she, how did she get all of those? <laughs> now, that's what I mean. You know, I mean, okay. go and do it. That's the most important thing. Wow, that was, uh, that was a very insightful... That was a very insightful interview. Um, in fact, it was more of a chat than an interview. Yeah, it was, more like of a, it. it was more of a learning session for me than anything. I feel a little... Uh, little underachieving <laughs> at the moment by that 14 year old who's who's making cash on the side yeah those doggy dumbbells that sounds awesome i'm gonna tell my aunt about them she owns a lot of pets <laughs> um so if, 
him, let him punch out into other provinces. <laughs> I'll become his agent in Joburg. <laughs> so if people want to, if people want to get hold of you, um, I think you mentioned, you gave us your. I've got your Twitter handle here. Your Twitter at handle Alex and underscore McLeod one. Yeah, or they can just go to my website. Okay. www.waterberry one word uh, dot biz, and there's a contact uh, page there, um, and they can contact me through that. Wow, that was a yeah, that was a very insightful chat. I mean, I got a lot out of that, and just for our listeners and viewers, some of the insights I picked up are really embrace embrace creativity from young people, teach youngsters to create opportunities, increase learning opportunities for high school learners aside from what's currently available and entrepreneurship is one of those uh, one of those options ideas are nothing without effort and implementation as well as execution don't sit and think it get out and do it thank you for 100%. joining us <laughs> thanks thanks Mongezi. thanks Much a lot appreciate it, huh? righty cheers <laughs>